Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands have def are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave a spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace there is judgment therefore is judgment far from us neither doth justice take overtake us we wait for light but behold obscurity for brightness but we walk in darkness we grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes we stumble at noonday as in the night we are in desolate places as dead men we roar like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. Salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood and judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street and iniquity cannot enter yea truth faileth and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey and the lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on, breast, or on, put on righteousness as a breastplate, and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garment of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay and repay recompense. <clears throat> so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words have I put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. Now keep your finger there in Isaiah 59. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14 in the New Testament. Now the first thing we see in beholding Isaiah 59 and verse 1, it reads, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. The truth there then is that the Lord, he is able. He is able to both hear and to save. Now when we go to Matthew chapter 14, We'll begin in verse 22, Matthew 14 and verse 22. The Bible says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship 
and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. When Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little of faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Here's an example here of Christ bidding by his word to come, his disciple to come unto him. And Peter then walking on the faith of the word that Jesus had just said, certainly would have doubts saying, I can't walk on water. What is this? Nevertheless, he had to believe the word of Christ when Christ said, come, and needed to act upon that word by faith. Jesus said, come, so if I go, certainly I'll be okay. Peter then steps out and begins to walk on the water going to Jesus. Nevertheless, though he had the promise of come, and the Lord standing before him, when he saw the wind around him boisterous, he immediately began to sink. But again, as Isaiah 59 says, our Lord's hand is not shortened, neither his ear dull of hearing, that he cannot hear. And he did not miss the cry of Peter, Lord, save me. And immediately he reached out that more than able hand, stretched it out, caught him, where he was at before he could sink, before he could get out of reach, before he had fallen too far. Now, of course, he challenges Peter afterwards and says, wherefore didst thou doubt? And we can all look at this as a story, as we often do, picking on Peter and saying, look at, he was walking by faith, he was doing great, and then he doubted and he fell, and then Jesus, Jesus went to him and said, well, wherefore didst thou doubt? You, you know, you unbeliever, and we beat up on him in the same way, but... <clears throat> Don't be so hard of Peter. He's one of 12, wasn't he? And he's the only one that stepped out by faith. He at least had the courage to go out into Jesus based on his word. Just one word, come. He walked on water for a bit. And he's got that claim to fame more than any of the other apostles. That he took the chance, stepped out by faith, and then also became an example of God's mercy. His stretched out hand and his ear certainly not heavy enough to hear, Lord, save me, as he reached out and saved his own. Back in Isaiah chapter 59, no doubt we are often the ones that are the problem. Doubt creeps in, unbelief creeps in. Here in a microcosm of the world at large, we can see that story of Peter, the water wisping and, and, and waves crashing upon him and around him as he tries to walk the straight and narrow on the word that he had heard from the Lord. As an allegory goes, those waves and those water are likened unto the world. And that's how we do. We, we walk a faith walk. We walk a trust walk. We walk even a miraculous walk upon the world. or slightly above it as it's billowing beneath us. You don't have to take my word for it. You can study water out in the scriptures. You'll find in, in Revelation that, that that great horse sat upon many waters. Later in the Bible it says these waters are nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. There's other places. Even in Isaiah chapter 60, you'll find it. I just don't have it at my fingertips right now. But you'll find the water referred to as the people. The people are, are likened unto the boisterous water then beneath the apostle as he tried to walk by faith. 
And on his word, believers, we are to, in the same way, step out of our comfort zone, step out of the ship, and on the word of God, as he bids us come, walk by faith, step by step, trusting all along in that hand that is not short, and that ear that is not heavy to hear. But where we fall short and fall flat is quite often in the area of faith. For believers, it's paramount. It's the principal thing. It's, it's the highest of, of goals that we ought to have for our lives is to be faithful, faith-filled Christians. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Faith is going to sustain you. Faith is going to carry you through. Faith is when things are dark and you cannot see and you don't know what is next on the horizon, next in your life, what the next day may be. Faith trusts that God is out there somewhere amidst all the confusion, amidst the waves and the turmoil, amidst the struggle. He's there with his hand ready and his ear attentive to hear you. Now, as we'll see in Isaiah 59, it's not only faith or it's not only unbelief that can drag a believer down. It's not like all I need is to just have faith and I will get through everything. I will never struggle. I'll never suffer. I will never do wrong if I just have faith. This kind of pie in the sky mentality. No, things can still impact us in our lives. <clears throat> when we think of Peter walking on the water, certainly he walked by faith, but I don't believe that he was untouched by the world. The heels wet, right? As the splashes came up on him, certainly he would have felt the effect of the world that he was walking through and navigating, yes, by faith. <clears throat> so believers, we, we can also be dragged down by the world's effect on you. We can also be dragged down by the world as the world itself goes down. Think of the waves of the sea, right? As I'm walking on waters, I'm walking that faith walk in Christ, set apart from the world. I'm getting splashes on me. The world's touching me. The world's getting a hold of me. The world's licking up on my ankles and getting them a little bit soaked as I'm trying to navigate this. Of course, the world has an effect on the believer, even as they walk by faith. Also, the world at large, as it's boisterous and going up and down, the world goes down, the world's drugged down, and the world takes Christians down with them. And this is the thing that we're going to start noticing, is that our Christian walk, while we are on the straight and narrow by faith, trusting God, doubt can cause us to hin be hindered in our walk. Also, we can be affected by the world coming upon us. Also, we can be dragged down as the world itself lowers in elevation, and the world goes down. So we need to be aware of, we need to watch, especially in these last days, as this world whirls and twirls beneath us and is boisterous and the waves cause it to, cause it to just swell and swirl beneath us. We need to be mindful of our own walk and understand how this walk is going to go in these last days. <clears throat> The only way that Christians can overcome then is to continue on by faith and trust that when the world begins to affect us, we'll always have the Lord's hand that is not shortened and his ear that is not heavy, ready there to help us. Now Isaiah 59, we're going to begin to see the state of the world. And as I read this, it really reflected on the day that we live in. Isaiah 59 and verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Iniquities and sins then are separating between the people and their God. It's like a hot air balloon of sorts, you know. You're there with God, and your sin may be deflated. You may have it under control, but as it gets pumped up, your sins and your iniquities are separating between you and your God. And when that happens, it gets to the point where He will not hear. And how could He with 
this great inflatable in between the two of you. Now for me, and for us as believers, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And certainly that's true. That's a true statement. The Pharisees made this statement, I think, grabbing a hold of Isaiah 59 and maybe even that psalm that I just read. In John chapter 9, they said, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. Now, I think they were wrong in this case. I think they were misapplying this. Because certainly it, there is that sinner's prayer. God hears that, doesn't he? But that sinner had the broken and the contrite heart when they came to God. So what's being referred to here is like that statement, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In other words, I know of the iniquity. I'm aware of the iniquity. I'm being, I'm being tempted and I'm, I'm being convicted by the iniquity of mine own heart. Certainly in those moments, you know you've done wrong and you're refusing to make it right. Yeah, the Lord's not going to hear you. And these people have the same issue. Their iniquities, their sins have separated between them and their God, and he will not hear as a result. Now, <clears throat> it's not that these are not being heard because they're sinners, because some people say that, you know, God doesn't hear unbelievers, or God doesn't hear sinners. I don't think that's true. I know that in my life, there were times when I, I think I called out to God best I knew him, and, and believed that that actually impacted my life later down the line. Some of us have similar stories. You know, the, the, the old atheists saying, you know, I don't even believe in God. And then they're like, you know, in a hard time. God, help me. <laughs> Reveal yourself to me, right? <clears throat> so it's not that God is not hearing sinners, but the problem is that their sins have separated between them and God. Their sins are something that has been placed between them and their Lord and therefore he cannot hear. There is a distance between. There is a gulf between. There is a space between. And I believe that the, the sinner that makes that prayer, that contrite sinner that needs to hear from God, they're going to do everything they can to get that out of the way. Not turning from their sins or anything like that, but to, to understand that they are a sinner and they can't help themselves removes the roadblock of the sins from between them and their God, essentially. And now God certainly will hear. Sinner or no sinner, it's, the, it's, the, it's how the person sees their sins that becomes either the problem or, or the potential solution. If I despise them and I know that they're sending me to hell and I know it's bringing me ruin, and I come to God and I say, Lord, save me from this junk. Save me from hell. Save me from condemnation. Certainly God will hear. But if I have all these sins in my life and I'm keeping them, I'm holding on to them, I like my sins, I like my attitude, and I say, hey God, can you, you know, I got all these sins here and I, I don't want you to see them necessarily. They're between me and you and I'm just hoarding all these sins away. But then I'm like, God, would, would you help my family's finances? <laughs> right? You can see the difference in the mentality, right? And that's the world at large these days. And I believe in the last day we're going to find more and more people getting spiritual getting religious, calling after God, but he's not going to hear because they're more interested in their sins and their iniquities that have separated them from their God than they are in the God that can save them from all those things. Continuing on in verse 3, watch what it says. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Here we see hands covered in blood. That's murder. That's violence. We see fingers with iniquity. That's theft. That's covetousness. That's treachery. You know, busy fingers, busy hands. We see lips that are covering, covered with lies, slander, and deceit. We see a tongue that is filled with perverseness, filthiness, curses just rolling off of them. If you spend any time on a public bus, or in the public square, or in a public school, Bloody hands, iniquitous fingers, lying lips, perverse tongues, run amok. <laughs> this is the world out, outside. This is what the public is made of. 
Verse 4, it says, None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They're trusting in vanity and emptiness and nothing instead of trusting in God. They're speaking lies instead of speaking truth with their neighbor as they ought to. They're conceiving mischief instead of conceiving children, instead of conceiving good fruit. And they bring forth another, another uh, you know, childbearing type word there. They bring forth what? Not, not children, not fruit, not fruit meat for repentance, nothing good. They bring forth iniquity. Thing is, is that these days nobody wants justice here in Canada. Nobody wants righteousness, right behavior, fairness, equity. They want none of that. If you ask people, do you want truth? They're not pleading for truth. They want nothing to do with truth. Ask somebody, would you like truth in your life? They might answer like Pilate, well, what is truth? What? <laughs> They certainly feel the same way when we bring a Bible to them, right? What is truth? Truth is whatever I think it is in that particular day, in that particular moment. And this way of the world is a trap and is a snare. Here it's likened unto cockatrice's eggs or the spider's web. You can read down in verse 5. It says, They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. So I think that word cockatrice is kind of new for us and hard to understand. So God just made this super clear verse for us to help us out. <clears throat> the spider's web is something we all understand, right? And how they work. They weave the web. They're a beautiful tapestry, and they're there so that some unsuspecting prey will come by, get caught up, can't move, stuck. The spider then wraps up the prey and either eats it then or saves it for later. Either way, once the prey's in there, the prey's done. It's stuck. Even before the spider arrives, it's just a matter of time before destruction comes. Now in that verse, it says, they hatch cockatrice's eggs, jump over where it says spider, and it says, he that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. What's that saying? Cockatrices, I believe, are like those, those snake-like creatures, right? Breaketh out into a viper. It says, that which eateth of their eggs dieth. So something thinks that it's just going to be a chicken embryo or a bird embryo, and there would eat it. What are they going to find? Whatever's crushed and breaketh out is a viper. These are those animals, I don't know if you've seen them, but they'll actually lay their eggs in an unsuspecting bird's nest. And then they'll raise it up just like it's their own, and then not suddenly that thing breaks forth and it's not a little chick it's a viper waiting to bite you waiting to sting you just like the spider's web it seems nice it seems okay it seems suitable until you're stuck in it until you're trapped and this is the way of our world it's a snare it's a trap verse 6 it says their webs shall not become garments neither shall they cover themselves with their works their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. Their work is iniquity. Their thoughts are iniquity. They're bent towards iniquity. And then we wonder why God won't help or won't hear. It's because their desire couldn't be further from God. And the Bible here is pointing out one of these us versus them scenarios. And yet, as the story of Peter goes, the world's way is still a trap to the believers. Still a trap to us, even though it's as a result of them and their decisions. Verse 8 continues and it says, The way of peace they know not. Who is the way? Jesus is the way. Who is the Prince of Peace? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We know this. It says, The way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know 
peace. We know Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the Prince of Peace. We know this, and yet they don't. They refuse it. Jesus is that straight and narrow path, and the world purposely here makes for themselves crooked paths, whosoever goeth there and shall not know peace. Do you know what the intent of the crooked path is? To lead you away from peace. To lead you anywhere but to the Lord. And even though we know the Prince of Peace, and we even though we know the way, and we're on the way, by and large, in our lives, though we stumble and fall from it and, and falter at times, we are on the way. There's nothing that's going to deter us from the way of Christ, ultimately. We are here in Canada, stuck in the mess that they made. When the waves froth, we get a little splash on us. When they go up, we go up. When we go down, we go down. We're walking separately. We're distinct. We're a chosen generation, a royal pri priesthood, a peculiar treasure unto God, walking differently above the world even, and yet we're still stuck in the mess they made. Just as when Peter doubted and just for a moment slipped and fell from the above way and into the wave, the crooked path, so we, by nature of where we are, where we live, sometimes fall in the same way as Peter. And it, and it really, ultimately, is not always our fault. Yeah, the doubt and faltering can be our fault. But the waves going up and the waves going down is just us rolling with the ways of the world. The splashes, it's just the world getting on us. And that's just part and parcel. We're foreigners here, strangers here living in Canada, here living in the world. And unfortunately, we're still subject to all the things. We're subject to their mess. Now, <clears throat> to divide that line very clearly, verse 2 and verse 3, it says, Your iniquities, your sins, your hands, your fingers, your lips, your tongue, they trust in vanity. They conceive mischief. They cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. Verse 7. Their feet run to evil. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Their paths, wasting and destruction are in those. The way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Now watch verse 9. Therefore is judgment far from us. See that? It's their mess. It's their wickedness. It's their ways. It's their bent. It's their folly. It's their wrong judgment. It's their iniquity. It's their evil thoughts. It's their lack of peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. It's our result. Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light. But behold obscurity. For brightness. But we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. Honestly, sometimes this tends to be the case of us in our world. How often are you out there living your daily life, looking for light, looking for goodness, looking for righteousness, looking for God, and all you see is obscurity. You want to see the brightness of this life and in this world and you're walking in darkness, groping at the wall as if you were blind, and even as if you had no eyes, stumbling in the noonday, roaring like bears and mourning. We're looking for judgment and we're finding it not. We're looking for salvation. It's far off from us. Our state is as a result of our surroundings. We go up with the wave, we go down with the waves. So we're walking on water when we're trusting by faith. Our current state is still as a result of our surroundings. We fall, we go up, we go down with the waves of this world. And this is just constantly going to be our state. 
Of course, we're not without sin. I'm not trying to say that God's people are just without sin. You know why? Because when we doubt, that's sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And that's usually what happens. You're walking high. You're walking tall. You're walking on water. You doubt for a moment. You start to think in your own flesh and in your own mind. And you start to sink. And now you've got world up to your knees. Okay, even when you are doing well, world's going to be splashing in your face and in your eyes. World's going to be tossing you to and fro. I don't think Peter was going for a Sunday stroll while he was trying to get through this tempestuous wave. No, I think it was an up and a down and a this way and a that way, a stumbling. And that's how we walk in this world. Certainly we're not as, we're not without sin. Though this passage gives the impression they 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 are wicked as a result here's our state that's true but look at verse 12 for our transgressions are multiplied before thee that's that's personal and our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us and as for our iniquities we know them and ultimately that usually ends up being the difference between the Christian and the unbeliever. Between the ways of the world and the ways of the servant of Christ is at least we know our sins. We know our iniquities. Talking to that, that brother I mentioned the other day. I like seeing a man that knows his iniquities. Because it puts you in a position where you can be saved from them. But look at it. As a result of being in this wicked world... Certainly the ways of the world have rubbed upon them. As a result, or, or as, as Lot did, he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And so after a while, you know, Lot walking on water, maybe when he first got there, he started to trudge knee deep, he started to walk waist deep, and eventually he was just of the world. Just another drop of the water. He, he, he succumbed to the ways of the world. Verse 12 continues. It says, Our iniquities, we know them. Verse 13, In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. And at least we know it, and it hurts us, and we know our frame. When truth falls in the streets of this nation, we understand it's not right. We desire brightness, we desire light, we desire goodness to come, and it doesn't too often. Here in our lives, we sin, we struggle, we're tempted, and we're tried, we're coursed, we're confounded, we're just cast about. And in our days, we struggle, but to what end? What is the end of all of these things? Ultimately, we ought to cry, Lord, save me, when we can't take it anymore. <clears throat> Truth fails in the streets. What I see from these people here, God's people, they acknowledge in the beginning, hey, the Lord is not, his hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But look at the state of this world. And this world's not going to have the ear of God. They're not going to have the hand of God influencing them. And sometimes we can look around in this world and just see that we're being torn in a bad direction. And here in Canada, I, I mean... Things are not getting better. And honestly, I see in the near future, I mean, we could go to lockdown part two. We, we could have this next one be, be severely enforced. We could all be jobless in a few weeks. You don't know how tomorrow is going to be, but the world has a way that they desire to go in, and it's not God's way. They want to follow their iniquities. They want to follow their sins. They want to follow... And we look at the way of the world and the direction they're going, and what can we do but go along with them? We're caught up in the ways. We're going up, we're going down with the world. We're getting covered with their sins. We're getting... We're getting... We're essentially at their control that we're trying to walk on higher ground. <clears throat> I, uh... 
when when Caleb was born and he was born early <clears throat> there was this song that that came in my mind you know farther along we'll know all about it and 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 when I was looking at the scenario I just found it hard to understand you know what what is going on here and when we're looking in the way of the world we're like what is what is going on here the world's going in the wrong direction and unfortunately we got to go along with it we all got secular jobs we all have mouths to feed we all drive the same we're of the world in it at least but not of it so what is the end of this all we sin we struggle we're tempted we're tried we're coarse we're confounded Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living among us. Never molested, though in the wrong. Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by and right now we don't understand what's going on in this world i don't <clears throat> i can definitely see the marks of them their iniquity their sin where they're going their direction it's all wrong it's all wicked but what we need to see is that our responsibility though it's hard is to just keep on that faithful path when truth fails in the streets Get ready for bullseyes to be on your back. Verse 15, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. You want to live righteously in these last days? You want to live after God? You want to serve Him? You're a prey. you got a bullseye on your back. Why? Because the whole world is going in one direction. When you're trying to walk above it, you're trying to stand tall, you're trying to follow God, you're trying to have faith in God. You want to live right? You're a prey. The world will look at you as a filth and off-scouring. More and more, it's coming. And we don't understand it now, but farther along, we'll know all about it. We'll understand why. Truth fails. You depart from evil. You've got a bullseye on your back. And it's getting harder and harder, and the struggle is real, but we need to trust that God sees it all. Verse 15 in the second half, it says, And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. He, we're, we're not alone in looking at the world and going, I, I don't get it. I, this displeased me. I don't like this. I don't want to go in this direction. I'm looking for light, finding obscurity. I'm looking for brightness, and it's just darkness and evil and hurt. We're groping for a wall so we can lead ourselves about this world. God sees it too. He's displeased that there's no judgment. We need to take assurance in the fact that judgment is coming. That second verse says, When we see Jesus coming in glory, when we see him from his place in the sky, then we will see him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Jesus is not pleased with the fact there's no judgment in this world. He is not pleased with the fact that the world is bent towards iniquity. Verse 16 there, it says, And he saw that there was no man and wondered why there was no intercessor. <clears throat> and I don't know how to, how to portray this or how to, how to properly describe what's on my heart. 
He saw that there was no man, and I believe there's lonely days ahead. There's going to be days ahead where maybe we can't meet in the same capacity that we are now. There's going to be days ahead where maybe we'll be scattered abroad. He said he wondered that there was no intercessor. When there's no intercessor, it's like you're alone. There's no help. There's no hope. We intercede one for another. We come here and we pray together. We have opportunity to tell each other what we're going through. <clears throat> when God looks out and says, hey, there is no judgment, I'm displeased. And he's wondering why there is no man. And he's wondering why there is no intercessor. But he's looking on the world where believers just can't get together in the way they ought to. Why? Because the world is going down a direction so far from God And we're getting swept up in it. The day may come where we may be separated. <clears throat> when Peter went to walk by faith, he had to step away from the other disciples, right? He needed to step out of the comfort zone of the ship. Ships like the church. They're on top of the world, on top of the waters, raging in the waves of the sea. By faith, Christ said, come. He bid him so, and he stepped out by faith. When you step out by faith into this world, you're going to get wet. You're going to get messy. You're going to doubt. You're going to be tossed this way and that way. <clears throat> Who knows, maybe your future has a day when God's going to bid you come. Step out on your own. And he'll look around just the same way you'll look around this world, and he'll say, hey, there's no judgment here. He's wondering where the men are. He's wondering where the intercessors are. He's wondering where the, where the fellowship of believers is. Where is everybody? But the Lord knows. I think farther along we'll understand it too. <clears throat> I've, been, I've been reflecting on all the things that are going on in this world. We're living in exciting times if we, can, if we can get a hold of the fact that things aren't going to be the same for much longer. <clears throat> Peter was probably comfortable in the ship, even though it was hard, even though it was sweltering, even though it was moving this way and that. It was probably more comfortable than where God wanted him to go. But there was exciting times. There was miraculous things on the other side of that ship when he stepped out into the water. I don't know. A lot of people have this impression that things are just going to return to normal. I have... <clears throat> From the first time it was like a two-week lockdown promise, I knew that this is the beginning of the end of how I knew things. Things are going to be different. I, I figured, hey, I don't, I don't see, I don't feel, it's not impressed in my heart that the world is going to recover from this. The Lord knows. Look at verse 1. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. None of this is surprising God. None of this is, is taking him by surprise. He can see what's happening. After all, if we take that picture, it was God that bid his people to step out and live differently, do differently, seek for light, seek for brightness, even in this dark world. Remember Peter, even when he started to doubt, started sinking, and he cried, Lord, save me. And God heard that prayer, and immediately salvation came. And I believe the same thing is being set up in these last days where God will look out, and he will analyze the situation, and he will say, hey, there is no man. Hey, there is no intercessor. In verse 16, the second half, therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. Who? The individual. And his righteousness sustained him salvation came and what came with it was vengeance verse 17 for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head and he put on the garment of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak salvation came and vengeance came with it and at this point, I believe that's all we really have to look forward to. 
The last bit of freedom in this world is essentially here in North America. When you look at the other nations of this world, they're not nice places to live. They are cutthroat, they are desperate, and getting worse every day. <clears throat> Any day the bubble could pop, and the illusion that we have here that is North America, the great wealth that we see could just all come crumbling down. And in that moment, it's going to be important we remember who the Lord is. His hand not shortened, nor his ear heavy. Cry unto him, and salvation will come, and he will bring vengeance with it. Verse 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Verse 20, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. God here is promising to show up as a redeemer dressed in righteousness, helmet of salvation upon his head, garments of vengeance clothed upon him, and a cloak of zeal will he return with. When he looks and sees no man, when he looks and wonders why there is no intercessor, no one calling unto him, he will show up and with his right arm bring salvation and sustain with righteousness those that are looking for him. The Redeemer certainly will come out of Zion, and them that turn from transgression in Jacob, he'll also come unto them. We need to trust God today for tomorrow's promises. Can we trust him today for his promises of tomorrow? <clears throat> when it's all said and done, I believe we will get to a point where that's all we have is the promise of what's to come. We may live out our days. You know, maybe things will just return to normal and we'll all get old and tired and then, you know, fade away as a leaf. I don't see it, though. I see this as a sort of calm before the storm. We're in the ship. Things are nice in the ship, but that wind is blowing. And that sea is about to get tempestuous. Things are going to start moving. We're going to fear like we're dying. We're going to wonder where Jesus is. We're going to think, oh, I remember leaving him on the shore. Why are we out here so far into the world without him? He's gone a long way. Where is he? We'll see him. And I think we'll be fearful. I think we'll wonder, is it a ghost? Certainly couldn't be my Savior until he speaks, until his word comes. It's him. It's the Lord. And he bids us come. Will we have the courage? Will we have the faith to step out? One of twelve. <clears throat> trust God today for tomorrow's promise he will not tarry even though it seems like he's tarrying even though it seems like things are getting hard even though things are, 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 are tempestuous around us certainly we can look at the world and see that they don't want anything to do with God and unfortunately for us we live with them and so when God's wrath comes when his anger and he starts to lift his protected hand off of the world and he lets the devil and his horde have their fullness on the nation that we live in guess what we live here too right and so we'll see these things and we won't understand them and we'll be concerned and people might even look to us and say where is your god now and we can say his hand's not short and he will save his ears not heavy he certainly hears me but you know who are the only ones that are going to be able to get a hold of him at that time of the world those that hear the Bible says, those that turn from transgression in Jacob. 
know what that means? How do they feel about their iniquities, their sins, their defiled hands, their fingers that are covered in iniquity, their lips speaking lies? Are they, are they still loving that? Are they still loving their ways? Or are they going to turn from those things, put them aside, and understand that they are on the wrong side of a judgment? They need God as he's returning. Yeah, I just see it today as uh, we're in the beginnings of a rocky road, the beginnings of a waving sea. It's, it's great to have believers, like-minded believers, meeting together. I don't know that this will always be possible. We all come from all different ways, all different lives, all different... I mean, what if they just set up in the streets, you know, armed guards, nobody's traveling unless we know it, unless we sign your papers... There's nations like that already. It's not that shocking that it could happen here. You need to get your vaccine. You need to get your papers. You need to get approval before you can go anywhere. The world is going in a direction, and I believe the time is coming when God will bid us to go and continue on in the other way. What's that way? The way of peace. The world knows it not. Try not to be concerned when you look for justice and find none, when you're groping at that wall, when you feel desolate as dead men, roaring and mourning, looking for judgment, looking for salvation, looking for righteousness. Just remember the Lord knows. What he has prepared is that he's going to return and he's going to set things right. So we've got to trust him for that, even when we're standing here. Think of Peter. Stepped out, walked, trusted the Lord in so much as to get along in that journey. It got to the point where he couldn't sustain it. He couldn't get any further. He couldn't. He needed help. Cried, Lord, save me. And God was there. I think we should remember that moment and think of that because the day is coming when you'll be at your wit's end, at your breaking point. Nothing left. Nothing in the, in the juice. No faith left. You can't even believe. You can't even give God some faith. You're going to fall. Lord, save me. And he'll be there. His hand's not short, nor is your heavy. He'll be prepared. Just be prepared to ask him in that day. Thank you, God, for this day.